welcome everyone to this session the z3 smt solver and uh, functional programming by alistair berry we are uh, glad that uh, alistair can join us today over to you alistair okay hi guys um it's really good to be here uh, i presented on functional conference 2019 and that was a really good experience so i'm really glad to be back here and um well, just about me a little bit. Um, my name is Alistair. I'm from Trinidad, and we're a very multicultural country right now. Uh, it's Lent um, with, with the Catholics, and it's also Eid, so we're actually having that together. So, and you know, people like you see like Catholics and Muslims are like fasting together. So, it's, like, it's a really, really cool. It's a very multicultural country. Okay, so my presentation today is going to be on the Z3 SMT solver and functional programming. So. I just want to give a short background just on the basics of symbolic logic and basically what's a, what is an SMT solver. So just generally symbolic logic is just a mathematical model of how we reason, how humans reason, and where we consider it basically just manipulating symbols rather than the actual senses themselves. Okay, so usually the first definition is that each logic has a particular language. So for propositional logic, you have true, false, P, Q, R, uh, not, and then the, for first order logic, you have symbols like 4A. Um, and of course, well, you have different rules which define how the formula, how the formula can be well formed. So, for instance, this formula uh, proposition, this is not a well formed formula right? because the implication operator is a binary operator. So, this isn't well formed. So, basically, that's basically an overview of what symbolic logic is. You have basically formulae and you have rules that define how these formulas will be formed. So, that's just really brief about proposition logic. I know you guys probably know all of this story, just a brief overview. So we just have a proposition, it's just a decorative sentence with a truth value. So it can be either true or false. Okay, so we denote those propositions by PQR, those symbols. And so we have PQR, they're atomic formulae or atoms. And then you have the connectives and we're all probably familiar with these. We have and, or, not, implies. These are all the logical connectives. And then computer programming languages like F sharp, we use symbols like for or and so. Uh, something like this. So we would have basically, this is an F sharp logical expression for proposition. So one proposition is that six is more than five, which of course we know is true. And the other one is that 400 divided by 10 is less than 30. And of course we know this is false. So these P and Q, these are, are our atomic formulae. And then the compound formulae would be things like uh, not Q, P or Q, P and Q, P implies Q. And these things, they all they all basically have a truth value um, defined by what the op whatever the operator is doing. Okay, so so the main topic that we're gonna consider today is satisfiability. So an interpretation is just an assignment of truth values to atomic formula in a formula. And we've all seen truth tables. And so basically a truth table basically gives all the interpretations of a particular formula. And a model is just an interpretation where a formula is true. So let's see, for this, so let's consider this compound formula, uh, not P or not Q, and the, this interpretation here where it's true. So we have to set P to false, F to false, to get this particular formula to be true. So this is on these, so that value, P is false, Q is false, is a model for this particular formula. Okay, and so when we have these atomic formulae, it's just we just have basically these symbols with P and Q, uh, there are two n possible interpretations. So in this case, we have two atomic formulae, P and Q. So we have four interpretations. Now, the thing is, if you have a very small number of atomic formulae, then it's very easy to figure out the inter different interpretations. But this basically blows up really quickly with exponential complexity. So if you consider, for example, uh, digital logic circuits. So this particular circuit has just five inputs, and but this will give us, so this will give us 32 interpretations. And of course, it just increases exponentially. So if you consider a circuit with 100 inputs, we're already way past, uh, you know, something that we could feasibly be able to manipulate as a truth table. So the basic problem is that solvers like Z3 uh, try to address is that Boolean satisfiability problem. So is there a particular interpretation of a propositional logic formula that satisfies it? 
So can we assign true or false to the atomic formula or the variables in a formula that would lead that formula to be true? Okay, and an equally important question is, is a formula unsatisfiable? Okay, so for instance, we know that P and not P, that's unsatisfiable, that can never be true. Now, this, the general satisfiability problem is decidable. You know, the very worst that you can do is just check the truth tables, even if it will take you forever. That's, that's the worst, it's, it's decidable. Uh, and of course, SAT solvers today, they use a lot of really um, great algorithms to be able to reduce that time. And there are many, many SAT solvers today, many SAT, PicoSAT, and, and Z3 also has SAT solver capability. So, okay, so we looked at propositional logic. So the first thing, the second thing we're gonna look at now is first order logic. So first order logic basically goes beyond propositional logic. And first of all, you consider this particular set, that's the universal discourse. So, and these constants, these are the elements of the set. So it can be numbers, can be, you know, playing cards, anything you want. And the language of first order logic, you have quantifiers, you have variables, uh, these variables, they are bound in the quantifiers. They are functions, they are predicates. So it's a simple example of a first order formula. For all x, y, the predicate px and the predicate py implies x is equal to y. That's just a simple first order formula. And of course, many mathematical theories can formalize using first order logic to them. So we can basically, so what is SMT? So SMT basically stands for satisfiability modular theories. Now, Remember we said that the propositional logic satisfiability problem is decidable, but that isn't true for first order satisfiability. That in general not, is not decidable. However, there are many theories or there are theory fragments that are decidable. So for instance, things like real numbers, uh, integers, uh, things like arrays, set detectors, we can actually form theories and take small parts of these theories and we can actually create a decision procedure for those theories. And basically, that's what an SMT solver does. That's what the model means. It's when you say, when you say model, you mean within a particular theory. So satisfiability within a particular theory. Okay, so basically, so the problem is given a formula, is it satisfiable in this particular theory? And that particular this theory constrains how we interpret those symbols. So so an example is, this is an example of a formula that even though it's a first order, if it's, it's a first order formula because we're dealing with integer arithmetic, it is satisfiable in the theory of, of in, integers. Okay, and we can find that this, has, this, is, this formula is actually satisfiable with a is minus one and b is five. So that's basically what an SMT solver does. It tries to determine basically if it is that this formula can be satisfied and hopefully in a reasonable amount of time because we actually want to get the answers to those questions. Okay, so the Z3 solver, well, probably you all are probably familiar with the Z3 solver. The Z3 solver, it's a solver from Microsoft Research. It's free and it's open source. And basically, it acts when you have a particular formula. You can, there are many, 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 many solvers and theories in Z3 that you can use. Okay, and it's very, very popular theory. And there are many, many use cases. And we'll look at some today in analysis, optimization, verification, for instance, doing things like checking your firewall rules if they're valid. But there are many applications for SMT solvers, and C3 is one of the most popular ones. Okay, so just getting into some of the details about how we go about interfacing with Z3. So uh, the native language for Z3, it's a language called SMT Lib2. Uh, that's sort of like a Lisp language, but there are interfaces for many languages, uh, C++, Python, .NET. Now, uh, it depends, basically the interfaces tend to depend on the particular language. What happens is that, for example, so the Python interface is a relatively high level interface, but you can see here that the, the .NET interface for a language like C Sharp, um, it tends to be very low level and getting down into the low level details of using the solver. So what we want to consider is how can we use Z3 in a functional programming language? where we can write basically idiomatic functional language with that is very high level. And we don't have to do things like, well, define custom types of operators. We want to be able to reuse all of the built-in facilities of the language to be able to use Z3. Okay, so um, we're just gonna, just gonna step talk about uh, F-sharp quotations. Okay, so uh, quotations are, are a very important part of F-sharp. They're similar to OCaml quotations. Basically, what you do is you put code, your code, within these delimiters. 
And what happens is that the compiler interprets that code as a syntactic structure. In addition to, what, in addition to whatever expression you're defining, it also has a syntactic structure that you can manipulate and inspect. And really, quotations are really this, the primary vehicle for doing metaprogramming in F sharp, and where you can basically have these have these syntax structures and use them for something else, for something for your custom purposes. If you're writing a DSL, then basically this is what you can you can use to write a DSL in F sharp. And the cool thing about quotations is that the same compiler and the same ID features like type checking, syntax checking, syntax highlighting, they are in there available for quotations. Okay, so let's, let's look at a little bit of a quotation. So here you have a simple F sharp expression. So it has a numeric value. Now, if we put this in the quotation delimiters, what happens is that this gets to in, into a symbolic expression. So now we have a symbolic expression. And you can see it's, it's a very list, list sort of like expression. We have opposition and we have the parameters here. So basically this is a symbolic, this is a symbolic uh, representation of that particular expression. And that this, and this particular expression is available for us to use. Okay, so uh, that so the expression has a code that's an integer, and the type of the quotation. Well, this is actually a quotation. Basically, it's a quotation that has that particular type system to it. And the, the types are, and you can also okay, you can also do things like well, if you define a function, then that particular function is available as well. So it's based on most. Um, I, I can't really think of any syntactic like feature of F sharp that isn't available uh, inside quotations. I think most of the features that you would get in F sharp, you can actually use them basically in, in quotations. Okay, so I just just talking about the code a little bit. So the quotation they have a particular type. So of course, F sharp is a statically typed language. So all the, all the expressions have a particular type, and the type is EXPR. And so well, basically, there are two types. One is a generic, and the other one is just a non-generic one. And what so basically, what happens is you can actually use the, you can actually use these expressions, and these expressions are type checked. So you can't actually compare, say, an expression of an integer with an expression of a real of a real number. Basically. So that that doesn't type check. And the most important facility is that all of these quotation types they can actually match using pattern matching. So pattern matching is one of the most powerful features, of course, in functional languages. So we really would like to we really would like to be able to use that if we want to interface with our Z3 solver. Okay, so and so this basically so quotation. So when you talk about a deep embedding, so a deep embedding is where you actually reuse the features and the structures of the language in your DSL, as opposed to a shallow DSL where you just have custom types and custom operators. So what we will be doing looking at today is basically how we can use quotation to create this deep embedding for to use Z3. Okay, so just to some more features of the so the, we see this is the so we have what well, we saw addition already and this particular feature in the second cell this is called something that's called splicing what that you do is basically if you have one quotation so we have j here we can basically splice this quotation into here and it will basically get and that so that's how you can manipulate uh, quotations okay and this and here is we're actually doing pattern matching so here's one we and there are many many patterns but these two modules these actually contain a lot of different patterns that you can use to with your F sharp quotations. So quotations are a really, really powerful feature. They are one of the most powerful features of F sharp. Okay, and the next thing, the last thing is that so remember we said that all of the all of the features that we would find in an ID or environment. So right now we're, we're in an F sharp kernel for Jupyter. And we can see that basically if we try to add, so if this is a quotation but we're trying to add an integer to a floating point number and that doesn't type check. So basically the compiler tells you, okay, no, this can't type check. So all of the features that you would have when you're using ordinary F sharp uh, in your environment, they're also available in quotations. And so basically we have all those facilities. So that's one of the things that really makes quotations so powerful. We don't have to write any like a separate, a separate environment or a separate compiler. The same facilities for F sharp that we regularly use, they're available inside quotations. Okay, and we can, so here we have a function and remember that with a quotation, you have both the value and you also have the syntactic structure. So the value stays, you can still use the value. So in this case, we have a function that we can compute this function normally, but we also can also treat it as a quotation. And when we treat it as a quotation, we can actually get access to the actual structure of the function. 
So, so quotations are a really, really cool feature of, of F Sharp. And that's what will get me looking at a lot today. Okay, so let's talk about how we can go about integrating uh, Z3 with F Sharp using some of the things we saw from quotations. Okay, so uh, we want to be able to represent Z3. Well, of course, Z3, it has its own language and Z3 has expressions. And these expressions, they have, they have what are called sorts. Um, sorts are, are kind of like, they're not exactly, well, you can think of them basically as an analog to, to types. Okay, and well, of course, when we're doing any sort of language work, we would want to be able to use pattern match. That's one of the most powerful features of functional programming languages. We're using pattern matching is to simplify how we do code translation and we do code generation. Okay, and well, you know, as I said, one way that we can, if you're doing like a shadow, a shallow DSL, we can basically use, okay, just use custom types like how Python does it. Okay, so this is what, this is our Python, this is the, from the uh, example from the Python Z3 library. So we have a custom type for uh, integer sort, we have a custom type for functions, we have a custom type for arrays, and this is basically, this is what we, we end up with. So this is an example of how uh, Python interfaces with Z3. So and so what, what we would like to do is so we would like to we would like we would like to do what we saw with Python, but in a very idiomatic, you know, functional way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, the XPR type that's built in from F sharp quotations. Okay, and by using that, we have a natural it's a natural mapping. So you know, if we have number three, that's a primitive inside F sharp, and that is gonna be our primitive inside for Z3 as well. And again, as you said. We have full support for these quotations. Uh, we have a really, really big library of patterns we can use, and it's very easy to compose your own patterns. Whatever patterns that we need, we can compose them. Okay, so uh, let's look at so let's look at some of the, the things that we would like to do. Um, we would like to be able to represent symbolic variables. So uh, we saw in the Python example we had an integer, we had a variable that was an integer sort. Okay, so we want to be able to have, we have these different sorts, we have integers, real numbers, booleans, we want to be able to represent those variables. And of course, we, we, will, we have the, these, all these, uh, all of these operations defined in a full sort of logic, we have these functions, uh, we have these operators, and we also have these logical connectors. So we need to be able to define, we need to be able to represent these operations in our F-sharp code. And of course, we would like to be able to represent things. So things like, okay, a system of equations, uh, a sequence, uh, you know, an optimization problem. How do you actually represent these things? If we have an objective function, we have constraints. How do you represent these things in F sharp? We want a way that's, that's concise, that, that's very easy to use. And, uh, you know, that also, but that also gives us access to the full power of Z3. Okay, so uh, just let's look, at, let's look at some F sharp code uh, to see how we can actually go about translating these F sharp quotations. So how can we interface F sharp with Z3? So uh, we just, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna, we just have one, uh, really it's just one function that, that we use really. We just have one function that creates a symbolic variable. Okay, so you can just peek at it. Okay, so this is our function. Okay, so we're just saying create a symbolic variable. And again, we're using a uh, type, we're using types from the F sharp quotations uh, library. So this is a var type. This is a type, this is a type that, that a variable in F sharp quotations. So with this one function, uh, we can basically do so, okay. If I have, so I can say that an integer, integer variable, uh, a variable with integer sort, I, I just, it's a generic function. So I just pass in the type and similarly for a real value. I can just pass in the type I can pass it as a real one. And those are basically, and those are the functions we're going to use to create our, our variables. And uh, with, with the quotation, so if we have an integer variable and we have a real variable, uh, we would like them, because they're different sorts, we would like them basically, we would like them to not to, to type check. Okay, and this particular, like when we do this particular expression, uh, this doesn't actually, this doesn't actually type check. So. I don't know if you guys can see the IntelliSense, but basically it says that, okay, but this, this type, uh, I can just run this, it doesn't work. Yeah, so basically the, our quotations are type check because, so we cannot use two variables of different sorts in an expression. So that's it. So this is a, a good preview. So like what we can do with, with quotation, using quotations interface with Z3. In comparison to well, Python, where Python doesn't really have this idea, a, a native idea of static types, so static type checking is one of the really great things that we can 